How do you beat an account stated claim in Florida when a junk debt buyer sues you for an account stated claim? My name is Michael Waslick. I'm one of the lawyers at Ricardo and Waslick here in Florida. And together with my partner, Jason Ricardo, I help people just like you overcome debt collection with dignity. And today I'm going to tell you how to fight back when a junk debt buyer sues you for an account stated claim. Every month across the state of Florida, junk debt buyers like Midland, Portfolio, LVNV, Cavalry, and a host of others file thousands of lawsuits across the state of Florida, and they are typically suing for account stated claims based on old stale credit card debt that they claim to have purchased from credit card companies, and they're trying to squeeze money out of those accounts by filing these account stated lawsuits. Account stated is the most common claim that a junk debt buyer will use in Florida courts. And I'm gonna tell you today how to beat an account stated claim, what it is, what the plaintiff has to prove, what defenses you can raise. Junk debt buyers love account stated claims because in many respects, they're simpler to prove than a breach of contract. If they wanna prove a breach of contract, they have to actually allege the contract, they have to prove that you agreed to the contract and all kinds of other things that come along with that. And the terms of the contracts that come with these credit cards are usually something that junk debt buyers like to avoid. And so instead of filing a breach of contract claim, they'll go for what's called an account stated. So I'm gonna tell you three things. Number one, I'm gonna tell you what the plaintiff has to prove. Number two, I'm gonna tell you what defenses you can raise. And number three, I'm gonna tell you the things that you'll need to research on your own, the things you'll need to know before going into court so that you're properly prepared to address an account stated claim. So let's start, what is an account stated claim? What does a plaintiff have to prove? An account stated claim is simply a legal fiction. It's the idea that if there is some kind of relationship between two parties and one party sends the other a bill and the uh, other party doesn't object to it, that there's some kind of implicit agreement, that there's a silent agreement to the amount that is due and owing. And in order to show, in order for a plaintiff to successfully allege and win an account stated claim, they have to prove a few things. Number one, they have to prove that there's that relationship between the borrower and the lender. Um, so in a case like this, they'd have to prove that there was a credit card account and they'd have to prove that there's some person that they've named as a defendant that actually had that account, used that account over time to form that business relationship. Number two, they have to prove that there's an unpaid balance. Usually they're going to do that using monthly statements that were supposedly sent to the borrower uh, that show the amount that remained on the account that hadn't yet been paid. And number three, they have to show that the lender rendered billing statements to the borrower and that there was no objection to those statements within a reasonable time. Now, in the case of a junk debt buyer, there's a fourth thing that they're going to have to prove. Because they're not the original lender and they're not the party that sent the statements, they're going to have to prove that there is a valid transfer of the account from the original lender, the credit card company, to the junk debt buyer. They're going to have to prove up the sale and acquisition by the junk debt buyer of that account and the right to enforce that account. So that's the fourth element. Uh, that's not a standard element of the account stated claim. It's, uh, it's an element of any lawsuit where there's been a transfer of interest. So the three things are the business relations, the unpaid balance, that the rendered billing statements uh, were not objected to, and then in a case where there's been a transfer of interest, they have to prove a legitimate assignment of the debt. What does it mean to render a statement? Typically, in almost every account stated case, that's going to be where the plaintiff comes in, the junk debt buyer comes into court and says, well, the credit card company mailed an account statement every month to the borrower and the borrower received those and didn't object to them. So it's the mailing of the statement that sets forth the current charges and the current amount due and owing that is the rendering of the statement. And it's the mailing that they will have to prove. One of the cases I've got listed on the screen is Spencer versus Ditech. I'm gonna show you how to pull that up before the end of the video. What the Spencer case talks about is how you prove that a statement or that any document was mailed to a defendant. And this is in a case where there's been a transfer of interest where they're trying to prove that somebody else previous to the current plaintiff mailed a statement. 
there are a few things that are important to know about proof of mailing. Number one is that as long as the plaintiff proves that the statement was actually mailed by the party who sent it out, that creates what's called a presumption of receipt. The court will assume absent contrary proof that the statement was actually received. So all they have to do is come into court and say, here's the evidence that we actually mailed this, or here's the evidence that our predecessor in interest, the credit card company, actually mailed this to the defendant. And if they introduce that evidence, they have gotten over the hump that they need to in order to make their prima facie case, the minimum evidentiary showing to sustain a cause of action, to sustain a lawsuit, to obtain that final judgment. The second thing that you need to know about mailing is that it is possible for a plaintiff to prove mailing by proof of regular business practice. So they can come into court with a witness that says, it is our company's practice to mail these statements once a month to everyone that has an account. Therefore, if this person had an account, we mailed it. And as long as the person who is testifying has personal knowledge of that mailing practice, because they worked there or they had training or they personally observed with their own eyes that practice of the business that did the mailing, that is sufficient proof. When there has been a junk debt buyer taking over the account, the junk debt buyer is going to have to prove the mailing practices of the credit card company. It has to make that proof in one of a couple ways. Number one, it has to produce an employee of the credit card company who can testify about the regular business practices. Two, it has to produce an employee who can testify that they have some kind of personal knowledge by personal observation or other means that they know what the business practices of the credit card company are. Or three, they have to bring in some kind of records showing that the mailing actually occurred. Those records could include things like a letter log or a correspondence log that show that certain letters were mailed out. Those records would have to be created by the credit card company and properly introduced, or they would have to show some kind of record of postage or some other evidence that the mailing had actually taken place. Now, it's important to remember that the proof of mailing just gets the plaintiff over the initial hump because it's something that they have knowledge of, it's something they can prove, and so the courts are going to allow them to rely on the proof of mailing in the absence of other evidence. For an account stated claim, actual receipt is the issue. So if a plaintiff proves that a statement was mailed and a borrower has evidence that it was not received, there can be no objection and the fictitious agreement that the law presumes where there's that no objection situation, if you didn't receive it, you can't object to it and therefore there can be no agreement. So if the borrower is able to come into court and say, I know I didn't get it or I don't remember getting it, I would have objected to it if I'd gotten it. If they're able to truthfully testify to that, then there is a dispute that has to be resolved by the trier of fact, by the judge who is sitting weighing the evidence. That dispute has to be evaluated by the judge and they have to find one way or the other. Now, a judge can believe or disbelieve a borrower who denies receiving it. It's important that when you come into court and truthfully testify that you never received it or didn't have a chance to object to it, that when you do that, you have some of those indicia of reliability that you that you are credible, that you're convincing, that the judge believes you're telling the truth. And it's not enough just to say, well, judge, I'm telling the truth, I swear. You have to have some kind of explanation for what might have happened. So for example, you might say, well, we have had mailing troubles in the past. I've only gotten one out of three of these statements or, or I've never gotten any statement or the address is wrong or whatever, right? Like whatever legitimate reason you might have. Or for example, you might say, well, we track all our mail or I save every, I save every statement that I get from all of my accounts. I have a detailed filing system. Here's the way it works. And we never got anything. This statement isn't in there. If I had gotten it, it would be there and it's not there. Therefore, I must not have got it. So you have to have some kind of explanation that would satisfy the judge how you know, how you remember that you didn't receive it. And it could be something simple like, I know this is wrong. Here's why I know it's wrong. And if I'd known about this statement, I would have objected to it for this reason. So again, you have to have some kind of reasonable explanation to satisfy the judge's curiosity about why it could possibly be that you didn't get this statement.
one of the ways that plaintiffs will sometimes try to prove mailing is by showing that prior statements had actually been received. For example, they might show, well, you know, we sent this statement and we got a payment back. So clearly they got that statement. And then we sent another statement, we got a payment. So clearly they got that statement. So they got every statement and now they're denying the last one. The judge is not gonna find that very credible if you deny that. So you're gonna have to have an explanation for what happened there and, and how that possibly could be true. And it has to be, again, persuasive and convincing. So remember that because the judge gets to weigh the evidence and decide who they believe in a case like that. Plaintiffs in account stated cases almost always rely solely on business records. And they do so because they can almost never produce a witness who has personal knowledge of the facts of the case, who actually participated in mailing statements or managing the account or anything like that. Those witnesses just don't exist in the large corporate setting that we're dealing with. And so they almost always have to rely on records. And in a case of a junk debt buyer, they're relying on records, not of their own, but of someone else. And so that gets us to the hearsay business records exception. I am not going to spend a great deal of time talking about what hearsay is. All I'm gonna tell you is hearsay is a rule that keeps out certain out-of-court statements that are unreliable, and you can make a hearsay objection to any document that is presented in court. And the way that the plaintiff is going to overcome that objection is by qualifying for what's called the business record exception to the hearsay rule. And in order to qualify for the business record exception, the plaintiff is going to have to introduce testimony showing that the record was kept in a particular way by particular people at a particular time. And you're going to find the details of that in Florida law 90.803 subsection six describes the business record exception and the questions that the plaintiff needs to ask in order to qualify a record for business record exception. Now, most judges are well familiar with business records and business records exceptions, and most judges are gonna to tend to admit any record that purports to be a business record, as long as the plaintiff does a barely competent job of asking the right four questions. In a case where there's a junk debt buyer, there's a wrinkle because the records they're seeking to introduce aren't the records of the business that is suing you. And so they are not going to be able to show that they kept the records. Instead, they have to somehow show that the previous business's records were accepted by them, were verified for accuracy in a way that allows the court to rely on them, that the business relied on them, and in so doing became part of their own business records. There's a specific case in Florida that talks about how one business can take the records of another business, import them into their own records, and how that verification process needs to happen. It's called Bank of New York versus Callaway. It is a foreclosure case involving the transfer of records from one business to another. And I put the citation on the screen. So if you wanna take a screenshot of that right now, you can. Again, at the end of the video, I'm going to tell you how to look up some of these cases so that you can use them for your own benefit. Now, I'm going to tell you some of the defenses that a defendant can assert and prove in order to overcome some of these things. But before I do that, I wanted to let you know, if you have a question about anything I've said, drop that in the comments. We do our best to answer every comment that we get either in the comment section or with another video itself. If this has been helpful for you so far, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you know somebody else who needs this information, a friend or family member, go ahead and hit the share button and send this video directly to them so they aren't missing out on any of that information. Here are five of the most common defenses you can raise in an account stated claim. Number one, payment or prior settlement. This is more common than you might think. Wires get crossed in the transfer of the loans between credit card company and junk debt buyer. Sometimes there's been a payment or a settlement of that debt before the junk debt buyer gets into court and the wires get crossed and they filed suit even though you've already settled it. And if that happens, if you can prove that you paid it or settled it, then you can win. And I've heard of this happening in court. It actually does happen from time to time. Payment is always gonna be your best defense. The way you're going to prove payment is with a canceled check, a receipt from an electronic payment, correspondence that acknowledges your payment, acknowledges the settlement, some kind of settlement agreement that you entered into, any kind of documentation that shows that that payment was made and accepted by the other side. And the case that says that payment is a proper defense, right there on the screen, the Home Health Services of Sarasota case. And again, we'll teach you how to look that up so you have access to it when you go to court. Number two, objection to statement. If you objected to the statement, if you actually got the statement and objected to it, if you notified the credit card company, this is wrong, here's why, 
then there's no agreement and it completely defeats the account stated claim. If you can testify that you objected to it either on the phone or in writing and the judge believes you, then the judge is going to have no choice but to dismiss that case because there is no agreement if you objected to the amounts due and owing. And the case there is the Merrill Stevens dry dock case, putting that on the screen. Again, I will show you how to look that up before we end the video. The third defense, proof of fraud, mistake, or error. If the plaintiff has done everything it needs to prove that they mailed you a statement, that there's an amount due and owing, and that there was a business relationship, and that they're the right party to be enforcing the debt, you can still win by proving that those statements were fraudulent, that there was a mistake, or some other kind of error in the statements themselves. So for example, if they billed you for something you didn't receive, if they charged you for a service you didn't ask for, if you're a victim, for example, of identity theft and somebody else ran up those bills, if you can prove something, some kind of fraud, mistake, or error, either by the lender or by some third party, then you will be able to defeat that claim. Again, assuming that you have proper documentation and that the judge believes you. The case that shows that fraud, mistake, or error is a successful defense, that's the Farley case that I've got on the screen now, and we'll show you how to look that up. The fourth defense I've touched on a little bit already is standing or ownership of account. When there's been a transfer from the original credit card company to a junk debt buyer, they have to prove that they're the right party who have the right to enforce the account because any statements that they're gonna introduce are gonna be from the credit card company not from the junk debt buyer. So there's no agreement between the junk debt buyer and the borrower about the amounts due and owing. They have to prove they stepped into the shoes of the credit card company in order to have the right to enforce that implied agreement. And so you're gonna to wanna to look at the furlong case that I've got on the screen in order to establish that as a defense. Usually the best way to establish a standing defense is to assert that the other side has failed to prove it. If you have concrete evidence that the credit card company still owns the debt or some third party owns the debt, then you might be able to affirmatively show lack of standing by the plaintiff, or they may just fail to introduce evidence on their own. The fifth defense you might wanna raise, statute of limitations. That simply means the debt is too old to be enforced and the statute of limitations that's going to apply in Florida uh, is going to be found under 95.11 Florida statutes and it is going to be either four or five years depending on the nature of the claim that is raised. So you'll wanna take a look at those. If the debt is old enough, you should be able to get it thrown out. All you'd have to prove is the date they're alleging there was a breach and the time that passed before they filed the lawsuit. Now that's not very common anymore because usually they're flipping those around within one or two years. So they're coming in well under that four or five year period. But if there's been some kind of delay or some kind of mistake, you might be able to show a statute of limitations defense. What you need to know, I've touched a little bit on the evidence code so far. Chapter 90 of Florida statutes contains the entire evidence code. Uh, I'm gonna show you in just a moment how to look that up. The rules of civil procedure. If you're in small claims court, you're gonna wanna look at the small claims rules. Otherwise, you're gonna wanna look at the Florida rules of civil procedure. I'm gonna show you where to find those. Then finally, again, the rules of small claims court. If you're in small claims court, you're gonna need to look at those. Um, and you'll wanna read the LaSalle case that I pulled up on the screen here because it talks about how small claims rules are just a special rule of procedure for claims of a certain size, but the county court will have jurisdiction over those claims, even if they're larger than $8,000, which is the current limit for application of the small claims rules. So I'm gonna show you right now what to do in order to pull up cases. So you'll wanna to go to your web browser, go to Google Scholar, scholar.google.com on the screen right now. You're gonna to wanna to click on case law and then you're gonna to wanna to click on Florida courts. And then you can type in the name of the case that you're searching for. So here I'm gonna type in Spencer versus Ditech. And that's going to pull up that Florida case that I talked about. And so you'll be able to read that on your own. Now you'll also be able to pull up cases based on the number up here. So for example, this 242 Southern 3rd 1189, if I type that into the search box, that would come up with the Spencer case. And uh, let me go ahead and show you how that works as well. So you wanna click on case law, type in the 242 Southern 2nd 1189, hit enter, it'll come up with the exact case you're looking for. All of the cases I put on screen have those numbers. You can look them up by number to know you've got exactly the right case, not one with just a similar name. So take a look at that. If you wanna look at the Florida Rules of Court, you can go to casetext.com 
and go to statutes, codes, and regulations, navigate to court rules, Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. That will give you the list of all the rules that apply to Florida uh, cases that are not in small claims. And so if you have a case in excess of $8,000, uh, which is pretty unusual, but if you do, you're going to want to look at that. You can also find the Florida Small Claims Rules on the case text by going to Florida Court Rules and then clicking on the Florida Small Claims Rules. If you're in small claims court and your court documents will tell you that, you'll want to read these rules and be familiar with how they work. That way, you know, when you're stepping into a small claims court, you, you know how the procedure works. You know that you're doing the right thing. One of the other things I told you to look for was the evidence code, Florida's chapter 90, Florida statutes. And you can find that again, go to statutes, codes, and regulations, Florida statutes, Title Seven Evidence, Chapter 90, Evidence Code. And that's going to give you a list of all of the statutes that are under the Evidence Code. You'll want to read, in particular, I recommend reading 90.803, which is the hearsay rule. And subsection six of that is the business records exception. You'll want to take a look at the Evidence Code just generally and make sure that you understand the Evidence Code to the best of your ability before you step into the court system. If you have other questions about junk debt buyers, I'm going to throw some more video information on the screen right now. Uh, don't forget to comment, like, and share if this has been helpful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.